Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us again for another Green Room Chat. I'm Denise McGovern, Vice President of Communications here at the Dallas Symphony. And this morning, I'm going to introduce our, um, our new chat. And Kim, if you could go ahead and take it away. Good morning, everyone. I'm here uh, live from the Morton H. Meyerson Symphony Center in the lobby. And I'm thrilled to be able to talk today with Jeff Tyzik. And Jeff has uh, been for many years uh, our head, musical director of the Pops performances that we have. And um, he has many fascinating um, parts of his career that we're gonna discuss today. So I'm looking forward to that, but let's start with the nuts and the bolts. Jeff, how are you and where are you? How you doing? <clears throat> Good to see you all. I'm glad to be here. Uh, I'm in, I live in Pittsburgh, New York, which is in Western New York, <clears throat> suburb of Rochester, which is home of many things, but for me, the most important is the home of the Eastman School of Music, where I went many years ago. Uh, but we, we've been here <clears throat> sequestered uh, pretty much since March and uh, working on thing every day, just trying to find really good creative time. I spend three or four, five hours a day writing music and then make sure I take a good walk and, you know, do what we do. That's great. Well, I'm, I see behind you, it looks very green and beautiful. Is the weather as nice as it looks? And have you been golfing is another question. Actually, I have been golfing and uh, I, I've been spending one of my part, I, I exercise in two ways. Jill and I go for a walk every day for four miles or so. And then I go to the range for an hour and work on my swing. Because I like swing, whether it's music or a golf club. So I've been having fun. And, you know, it's been beautiful, actually. The one thing that I've been doing out from the house is actually going to the golf course, you know, socially distance and all that. You can't touch the pin. You can't do this. But you're in a beautiful environment. And it's, it's a reflective time. Uh, cause I'm not one of these guys that if I, if I miss a shot, I don't throw the golf club. I just go, thank you. It'll be good next time. <laughs> you know? It's actually, actually it's, it's good to, for your personality to play and, and to have reign of your emotions, you know? So it's, it's a good thing. It's very much like music. You really have to practice to get better. So I, I have things that I'm doing, but I, I'm spending a lot of time writing music. Um, some arrangements that are going to be for future concerts, but I'm also working on uh, something I've been wanting to do for a while, working on a chamber piece for oboe, string quartet, and piano. So, you know, I'm doing things, being productive. That's fantastic. Well, we are sad that you have not been able to come here for the performances for obvious reasons with the whole pandemic um, happening. Uh, everything's been canceled for us since... Um, beginning of March, essentially March 9th, and, uh, you know, looking not great until the fall, but we shall see. But meanwhile, we had been hoping that we'd be able to have you at least to do something um, in the Meyerson without people this month, but that didn't pan out. But you um, did the Herculean task of um, arranging all the music that we were scheduled to use because we changed the number of players a bunch of times and we wanted to live stream it and that requires paying hefty publisher fees. So you were helping us out with all of that. Will you tell us like about that or musical emergency? Well, we, we started off, you know, we, we had a film music concert planned and then Peter got, got Peter Turney got in contact with me and said, well, we have to do it with 45 players. And so I started looking through all the film music and I came up with a program that could work with 45 players. And then about five or six days, seven days later, he came back and said, well, now it has to be 30 players. And I said, impossible to do any of that kind of music, but I think we could do a Scott Joplin. Uh, I, I have a concert that I've done parts of. It's music of Scott Joplin. Uh, and ragtime music, and by the way, the ragtime era was right after the first pandemic, so that was kind of ringing in my ears. But I have Jelly Roll Morton, Scott Joplin, early Gershwin, uh, and Scott Joplin is public domain, but the arrangements of Scott Joplin are not. 
and there was going to be huge licensing fees. And I've wanted to orchestrate those anyway. So I, I spent Memorial Day weekend, I think about 36 hours rearranging five or six Scott Joplin pieces so that it could make it work. But then, then when certain issues came up about uh, the size of the musicians and whether or not, you know, if somebody felt uncomfortable, uh, you know, what we were going to do about that, it, it just became untenable. And, and I, I really felt bad about it. I mean, I was happy to do the music and we're going to use it for some other purpose, I'm sure, because everybody is talking about uh, social distancing on stage. I, I mean, I, I am involved with four orchestras and I love each one of them dearly and all the musicians. But I, you know, I'm involved with the Dallas Symphony, the Detroit Symphony, the Oregon Symphony, and of course here in Rochester where I've been for <clears throat> principal pops here for 27 years. And we're all dealing with these issues. How many people are we gonna get on stage? What about the audience? Are we gonna do one hour concerts? Or, you know, we're, we're all dealing with it. And, and I know there are people who want answers, but our issue is, and I'm sure you're feeling it, we don't have the answers because we're subject to the, what, how this all is going and trying to get answers from the quote unquote experts, which changes week to week, day to day. So it's hard to do the future planning. So I, I've, I've been involved in all kinds of Zoom meetings and all things, but I, I am thinking about uh, social distance orchestras if we, if we do that. And it just turns out that a lot of my concerts, even one that we have planned for next season, Queens of Soul, the orchestra for that is only like 18 people. It's a small, it's a small, what I call symphonic rock orchestra. So I already have six or eight concerts that work for that in, on the pop side. So I've been busy, believe me. <laughs> well, tell us about some of the programs you have planned for next year. You just told us about the Queen of Soul, a little bit about that, but there's a lot to look forward to. And also we hope to be able to reschedule a couple of these things that we had to cancel this year, like the Beatles program. So tell us a little bit about some of those. Well, uh, Queens of Soul is an amazing concert because it's uh, Tina Turner, Aretha Franklin, uh, Janis Joplin. It's also Adele, Amy Winehouse. So we're really spanning uh, uh, a tribute to women who have really made a difference in music and who, who sing this sort of gutsy, like really incredible earthy music. So that's going to be a great concert. Uh, also, we're, we're, we have the Selena concert planned for the fall and it's uh, you know that, that wonderful uh, Latina artist uh, and her material. So we're, we're planning that as well. Um, we've got film music coming up. I mean, we, we have some really great things planned for next season. So let's go back in time uh, to when you were at Eastman. Um, and did you think you'd be doing this? What did you think you'd be doing? Obviously, you were at a music school, so you, you knew you'd be in a career of music. But is this what you imagined? And you've really done some um, unique things that other conductors don't do at all, all your arranging and many other talents that you have. Well... When I was 13, I was home from school uh, it, sick one day, and I, I turned on WNET in New York, because uh, I, lived, I lived north in New York, about 75 miles in a little town called Hyde Park. Turned on the TV, and I heard this music that it just blew my mind. I, didn't know, ha I had no idea what it was. And it turns out it was Zubin Mehta conducting the New York film, The Rite of Spring. And I was, I was glued to that, that performance. So prior to that, you know, I, I started playing the, the trumpet well before most, most kids. I started playing in third grade. Most kids don't play till fifth, you know. But early on in my career, my, my career, I'm talking about sixth grade, I learned from sixth grade to uh, 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 middle school, I learned three important things about music. The first one is you can, it, well, actually four things. One is if you really practice, work hard, you can get better, you can, you can have self-discipline, you can learn how to express yourself. And I came from a troubled family, so for me, music was an amazing way for me to express my emotions in a very positive way. So that was a good thing. Second thing I learned, you can meet some really incredible people. Uh, when I was in sixth grade, uh, we had a marching band, believe it or not, elementary school marching band, and we were going to march in a Memorial Day parade. The night before, my teacher called and said, hey, 
tomorrow there's a, a service at the Roosevelt graveside and they want a young trumpet player to play taps. Would you be willing to do it? I said, yes, Miss Holloway, sure. You know, so in the morning, some guy picked me up, American Legion, drove over to the Roosevelt mansion. I walk in the back to the graveside and there's four guys standing there with military uniforms, medals. There's a color guard and Eleanor Roosevelt and her son, John, and me. And so I, I played taps, you know, I was pretty worried about it, but I did that and, and I realized, you know, music's pretty interesting. You can meet some pretty incredible people. And not long after that, uh, I was uh, playing in a little band, just playing some tunes in, in junior high school. And one of the guys who was older than me said, hey, we have a job. We have a job in, in two weeks from now. So at the time, I was working at a car wash making a dollar five an hour at a car wash weekends and summers. And we played in this bar and I made $15 for two hours. And I said, wow, you can make money doing this. You know? <laughs> and I went to Eastman by accident. I, my band director said, hey, you're gonna be a band director. You should go to a state school, go to Fredonia. But I had an incredible friend who went to the Eastman school, turned out to be one of the best reed players in the world. He worked with Chuck Mangione for 14 years, recorded all these incredible albums. Chris Vidal was his name, he left us recently. Um, and I ended up at Eastman and I, 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 my mother said to me, you know, you should play music on the weekends and go to IBM and become a worker at IBM. And I said, yeah, see you later. And I had no idea what I was in for. I mean, it was a run, like uh, the run was amazing. So I went to Eastman uh, and I, I studied composition with Sam Adler and Warren Benson, those composers, but I also studied arranging with a guy who had been the music director of the Radio City Music Hall, Rayburn Wright, a really well-known person. And then I worked with Chuck Mangione, who was the teaching at the time. And then after Eastman, I went on the road with him and, and I started conducting sessions in, in uh, you know, uh, recording studios. And then in 1980, the, the CEO of the R Rochester Philharmonic said to me, I'd like you and Alan Vizzuti, this world famous, amazing trumpet player, I'd like you guys to do a Pops concert. We said, yeah, why not, you know? And we created a Pops concert uh, called High Class Brass. It had classical music. We played the Vivaldi trumpet concerto, but then we played jazz and we played original pieces. And we ended up conducting the concert. And that was my first gig, it was like 1980. And I was like, wow, I love this. This is incredible. And you know, over the years I had re recordings out on Capitol and Polydor of my jazz groups. And I was doing a lot of arranging, mostly commercials in the studio. And uh, we, Steve Ovitsky, who was the general manager of the RPO at the time, was also the manager of the Grant Park Orchestra. So he invited us to play that summer with Grant Park. And before I knew it, we were playing with St. Louis, Minnesota, with Minneapolis, you know, Minnesota. We're playing with, with the, you know, orchestras all over the country. And, and we're talking about top tier orchestras. These two little guys come in, you know, and I'm conducting these orchestras. I mean, I didn't come through the, oh, I'm gonna be an assistant and I'm gonna do this, you know, Milwaukee Symphony, like, you know, I mean, it was crazy. Um, so my, uh, and I'll, this'll be the short ending. So we had an agent at the time and the guy, it was funny because he was the tuba player of the Chicago Lyric Opera Orchestra. So if you know anything about opera, tuba players have a lot of time off. They get paid a lot of money, but they're not playing their horn too much. So he had this little agency and he was kind of like the uh, Broadway Danny Rose of agents. You know, he probably had a one arm juggler and stuff like that, but he had us. And uh, so he came to me one day and said, hey, look, I've been hearing from orchestras. They really love your arrangements and they think you're an okay conductor. Why don't you put a show together and, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll market it. And I said, yeah, sure, okay. And I thought about it for two years and I was like, well, what, what am I going to do, you know? So he called up one day and said, look, what are you doing on, you know, June 22nd, like next, next spring? I said, well, I don't know. He said, okay, I just got you a gig, Chattanooga Symphony, a swing concert, do it, hung up the phone. And that was it. So I created that concert and uh, it was really successful. And in the meantime, occasionally I would perform with the Rochester Philharmonic. Uh, and then in 1994, it just all came together. Uh, I went into the management of the RPO. I said, look, I have an idea for a concert for the Pops. They said, yeah, we'll call you. And they, I had tried other times, they never called me back. So finally the CEO called me up and said, she said, look, 
I like this idea, let's do it in the fall. I did the concert, it, and it was a concert that featured the orchestra doing what they do, but differently as well. So for instance, I conducted Mozart, Adagio, and Fugue, but then I wrote a 12-8 blues for the string session. And then the, tr the uh, clarinet player, we did a movement of the Weber clarinet concerto, and then I wrote a Dixieland piece for him. So it was kind of like that, all back and forth. Concert was very successful. The next month, they offered me the position of principal pops. And that was kind of the beginning. And after two years of that and, and doing selected guest conducting, uh, just things went crazy. What can I say? <laughs> it's weird. But here I am. And uh, I would say life has exceeded my expectations. I mean, I get to conduct the Dallas Symphony, the Detroit Symphony, Philadelphia. I've conducted the LA Phil to Hollywood Bowl. I, you know, I've conducted the Philharmonique de Monte Carlo, Royal Scottish National. I mean, I've had opportunities that I just, I never imagined would happen. And I've had, you know, my, the other side, which people in Dallas don't know about me is my, my classical, you know, my classical quote unquote composing. And I've, you know, I've been able to premiere pieces and, and concertos and stuff. So, I, I mean, I have been so fortunate, I, I couldn't even, I couldn't even begin to tell you how thankful I am for all of that. Well, that's amazing. What a great uh, story of your life, which is pretty um, incredible. As you said, you didn't follow the typical path of a lot of conductors. And um, you have been working with the Dallas Symphony for many, many years. And I know the musicians have a wonderful rapport with you. Tell us, uh, some of your favorite musical moments in Dallas. And I, you also go with us to Vail or we go separately because you're coming from New York and we're coming from Dallas. But we meet up in Vail for performances each summer, not this summer, unfortunately. And um, I just love to hear what some of your favorite memories or moments are, musical moments with the DSO. And also just what are your top memories really in, in all of the conducting that you've done? Well, with the DSO, uh, and, and I, I'm, I'm gonna give you specifics, but I really wanna say there's never been one concert that I haven't treasured with them. I, I, I love being on stage with them. We have such a great time together in rehearsals on stage. We've developed a trust factor. I, I mean, even if we have a short rehearsal time or, or, or something happens, I, I trust that they're gonna be there and give it everything they have, and I think they trust me. So that said, uh, actually one of the concerts that really stands out to me wasn't, wasn't that long ago, and it was when we did the uh, Bernstein celebration. Uh, I, I really loved that music, and I got to do some repertoire that I don't usually get to do. Uh, and we did one of his incredibly difficult pieces, this aria for soprano, uh, and it's all these mixed multi-readers, and, and I, I really had to work really hard that week. It, it was, it's a really tricky concert, and to me, it was almost like a classical series concert, and it, it was really a fantastic experience. And, you know, our film music concerts, and, and even when, you know, when we run out to Greenville, we've had these really beautiful moments together with uh, playing this music or, or going to Denton and playing uh, Run Out There. I've enjoyed those experiences with the orchestra. And of course, uh, in addition to what we've done in the hall, a myriad of concerts. I mean, one incredible concert, we did this uh, blues concert with Byron Stripling and uh, Dee Daniels and Wycliffe Gordon, the trombone player from the Lincoln Jazz Center. And I mean, it like just blew the roof off the place. It was incredible. Uh, and the audiences have been so responsive to that. And of course, when we go to Vail, it's a very meaningful uh, experience out there. We're playing for an international audience. And our 4th of July concert is something that has been a tradition. Actually, I've, I've done them for 25 years out there. But it's, it's such a magical moment when to see everybody come together and really celebrate America and to have the music be so meaningful. And we've had this tradition, which started actually with, with me in the Dallas Symphony, where we invite a wounded warrior to come on stage and narrate a beautiful piece of music called Gardens of Stone, which was composed by Jim Beckel, who played in Indianapolis, but was also a colonel in the Air Force. 
And it's this very moving piece about veterans and to have a wounded warrior come on stage and appear with the orchestra has been, it, it's incredible experience. So there have been many, many moments like that. Uh, I was actually on stage other other places. I was actually <laughs> I was on stage with the Royal Scottish doing a Scottish proms, and the first half was Evelyn Glennie uh, writing a new uh, com I mean uh, performing a new piece by Eric Awayson, and on the second half I had the Royal Scottish, ten bagpipers, eleven piece drum line, and a sixty voice choir. And the sound, I mean, it would blow your mind because actually in, in Glasgow, there's a conservatory for bagpipe players. And the, it's so musical. It's not sort of what we're used to, you know, here. It, these, and there are these anthems that have been written for the orchestra with choir, bagpipers, drumline, and, you know, 95-piece orchestra. And it was the most haunting thing ever. The only crazy thing about it was I had to wear a kilt on the second half. That was part of the deal. So that was, uh, uh, that was an interesting moment when I was told, uh, Maestro, we'd like you to wear a kilt. And so I, I did it, but uh, I wasn't that thrilled about it, but it turned out. You know. And I, you know, to be, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, no, go on, go on. I was going to say, you know, or to, or to be at Saratoga with the Philadelphia doing like a, a film night. And actually, you know, one of my dreams uh, as a kid, I used to watch, the Boston Pops with Arthur Fiedler. And I, I was actually with Arthur Fiedler once in an elevator at the Eastman School of Music. He was standing next to me. I looked up at him and I said, ah, that's Arthur Fiedler. Never, never said a word to him, but you know, I, I was, the Boston Pops, I think was uh, a force for me early on in my young years. And then later on when I started putting Pops together and I went back and looked at the programs Fiedler had done in his early years, where you know there would be a movement of a Beethoven concerto and uh, against you know uh, a you know a popular overture of the day and then the a guest artist and then it would be jazz. I mean, he his pops encompassed all kinds of music, which is the philosophy that I believe in. So I think the first time I got to uh, I was invited to conduct the Boston Pops it was a really uh, special experience and it was funny because the musicians back home they'd say oh well, well wh who are you conducting i said well you know i i i i conducted philadelphia and well i was in monte carlo and, and well i got a chance to to do you know seattle and i, and I was in dallas and in detroit and there and the players in the orchestra are going oh okay yeah great and i said well i'm going to do the boston pops they're like the boston pops i mean the 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 vibe that the boston pops had was was amazing so I, uh, that experience was incredible, and I got to go back, I think, uh, four more times, and I really enjoyed that. So, so I, that was something I never imagined I'd do. Uh, actually, I never, <laughs> I never imagined I'd do any of this, but, uh, so there were some great moments. Um, actually, the Boston Pops is famous for its arrangements, and, and you are also famous for your arrangements, so um, there's that interesting commonality. Um, we're going to take a few questions um, from Facebook, but before we do that, would you just mind talking a little bit about the process of arranging? Because I don't think people understand really what that means and what mm. you're doing. Well, a lot of composers, Richard Rogers, for instance, is one of them. Uh, he wrote his music at a piano, and when he finished the song, there was a piano part and a vocal part, or unless it was a, a waltz or, or some piece that was going to be instrumental. But it was just a piano piece of sheet music. Well, somebody has to take that music and make it work for a symphony orchestra. So it means you have to decide what instruments are going to play the melody, who's playing the background. Uh, and so if you just take Richard Rogers' piece and you change the music to fit a symphony orchestra, but you leave the piece exactly as it is. That's called orchestrating. So you take a piece for piano and you make it work for flutes and bassoons and trombones and trumpets and strings and percussion. So you're orchestrating it. You're not changing how the music works. You're just changing how it's going to sound. Well, arranging is closer to composition 
because you're taking Richard Rogers' song and you're saying, well, the song is good, but I think I want to add a transition section. Maybe I want the ending to be a little bit different. Uh, maybe I want the voice to come in here, but then I want backgrounds to do this. So you're actually changing the structure of the composition. So in a sense, you're, you're adding compositional elements. Uh, you're making up music to also work with the existing music. So you're, you're not only blowing it up for a symphony orchestra, but you're making the music dramatically different in certain ways. So you're, you're composing, composing and arranging are, are getting closer together. Uh, and a, a famous example of just orchestrating is Mazorsky Pictures in an Exhibition. That piece was originally just a piano piece. And the big piece that we hear today was orchestrated. There are various composers who did it. Uh, so they took that music and, and made it work for symphony orchestra. Uh, an arranger also, I mean, let's take a piece like Bernstein's Maria, for instance, from West Side Story. Well, you can do the original version, but maybe some composers, or I mean, some artists, like let's say if Johnny Mathis wants to sing Maria, he's not going to sing the version that's in the show. So somebody will take Maria and arrange that in a way that works for Johnny Mathis or Frank Sinatra will take a Cole Porter tune and instead of just doing the basic sheet music, he's got the Count Basie orchestra and they're gonna do some version of it that's kind of really good and sassy and brassy. So somebody will take that original music and then transform it into a new version. And that's what arranging basically is. Thank you, that was an amazing explanation which I think will um, really help a lot of people understand the the really uh, brilliant work that you do for all of the orchestras that you, who you work with. So um, let's we've covered a lot, but let's see what other questions we have from the people who are watching today. Hi, Jeff. Um, a question came in, um, kind of a fun one. What is the silliest or most embarrassing moment you've had to deal with on stage with you or with a guest artist? Um. <clears throat> I had this one Broadway singer, very famous. He was very famous for Jean Valjean in, on Broadway and Les Mis. And we were doing a, a show that had a, a song from The Music Man, and it's uh, called You Got Trouble. And it's, it's a patter song. So it's one of these songs where there's just a, so many lyrics, you know, you're just rapid firing all these lyrics. So it probably has, 10 times the amount of lyrics a normal song does. And he was doing this broad, uh, Broadway concert with me for the very first time in a little town in uh, Erie, Pennsylvania. And I had the Erie Philharmonic this many years ago. And we start the song. He's doing it for the first time in the concert. And he did it okay in rehearsal. We get in the concert. <clears throat> he gets like 25% in and he stops. Can't remember the lyrics. So I stop the orchestra and the people in the audience are they're laughing a little bit. I'm like, yeah, let's do it again. And they, they, they think this is part of a shtick, you know? Second time, same thing. And now I look over at him and, and I see beads of sweat pouring down. <clears throat> Third time, same thing. And we're on, now we're on mic, you know? And, and he turns to me and goes, Maestro, what are we gonna do? I said, well, we could go out for a beer, but let's just do it again. And I, I hit it again and he finally got it the fourth time. So. That was a pretty crazy moment, I have to say. Uh, and, and I've actually, I've been in a few concerts where uh, musical train wrecks have happened. Uh, and actually one happened in Dallas. Uh, we were doing the uh, uh, Bacchanal from Samson and Delilah. And at the end, it comes to this section where it, all of a sudden the timpani plays this really bombastic and, and the tempo changes to get really fast and the orchestra section by section starts coming in. And we got to this one point and a certain section of the orchestra got a little, little ahead of things. And we, we got to the end, it's supposed to be this, you know, and it was like a, you know, and then the audience was sort of like, you know? And so what do you do at that moment? Uh, I've had this happen in my career. And I just took the microphone and said, ladies and gentlemen, You've just witnessed a musical train wreck, and I'm sure you would like to hear this played the way it should be, wouldn't you? And of course, the audience goes crazy, and then we hit it again. 
And after the concert, uh, there were a few, uh, this is before your time, Kim, a few, uh, there were a few management people who came back to the dressing room and said, man, you planned that. That was so good. <laughs> so they thought I had actually planned that to happen. So things happen and you have to think of uh, what you're going to do at those moments to make it, you know, a good experience. And anything can happen when it's live and things often do. So you just got to figure out how are we going to make this a great experience and move ahead. Um, wow, I, I missed that concert. I, I'm, that's, that's pretty funny. Um, the last question that we have actually is um, about musicals. Do you have a favorite musical? Yeah, well, I have, I have two. Uh, I have a vintage one and I have a current one. Um, I, for some reason, I just always love My Fair Lady. I just think that the songs in that are so beautiful. It's a beautiful story. Uh, it, it's, it's absolute perfection, I think. Uh, and then a transition musical that I love also is Porgy and Bess, okay? I mean, that's, to me, that's American opera kind of, you know, musical. But I would say that I saw Hamilton in New York, uh, and I started weeping like 45 seconds into the, the opening. It was so powerful, and the, the message from that musical hit me in a very spiritual way without really, I mean, I thought, I knew that I'd listened to the music before, so I knew the story and all that, but there was something that just jumped off the stage that just touched my psyche that, you know, I was, for the whole thing, I was just amazed at, at the musical and, and the message and how well it was done. And, you know, and the fact, I mean, that, okay, there was, you know, rap in it but but it was done in such a great way that you could understand all the words and it was meaningful and it wasn't just in there gratuitously it was really important and so I, I would say you know I would cite those three well I think that's a that gives a pretty good range of the kind of music that you like which is what we see every time you come and program for us how everything fits together through that time um, well I think that's all that we have for today Kim do you have anything else uh, no, I just want to thank you, Jeff. It's really wonderful to see you on the screen. We should do this more often, but perhaps not in front of thousands of people. We should catch up by Zoom. And um, I hope you enjoy the beautiful spring, summer weather in New York, and I look forward to talking with you soon. Well, thank you so much. And I, I just... I just can't, uh, you know, uh, be effusive enough about how much I enjoy the Dallas the whole Dallas Symphony, I mean, you, the staff, the incredible musicians, and of course the audience. I mean, I really feel like we've become friends over the past uh, six years especially. And uh, I, I look out in the audience and I recognize the same people. And I've just been thrilled with, with the audience's acceptance of, of what we've been doing. And I, I feel uh, you know, very appreciated. And I appreciate them as well, because without the audience, who are we? You know, so it's it's for me. It's an incredible experience, and whenever I know I'm coming, I'm I'm, I'm geared up, ready to go, and, and really thrilled to be there. So thank all of you. Great. Well, thanks again, and we will sign off now.